existed many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John 20, 30 to 31. I feel so strongly that among those of us who have grown up in the church and who can recite the great doctrines of our faith in our sleep, and yet who can yawn through the Apostles' Creed, that among us something must be done to help us once more feel the awe, the fear, the astonishment, the wonder of the Son of God, begotten by the Father from all eternity, reflecting all the glory of God, being the very image of His person, through whom all things were created, upholding the universe by the word of His power. You can read every fairy tale that was ever written, every mystery thriller, every ghost story, and you will never find anything so shocking, so strange, so weird and spellbinding as the story of the Incarnation of the Son of God. How dead we are, how callous and unfeeling to your glory and your story, O oh God. How often have I had to repent and say, God, I am sorry that the stories men have made up stir my emotions, my awe and wonder and admiration and joy more than your own true story. Perhaps the galactic movie thrillers of our day can do at least this good for us. They can humble us and bring us to repentance by showing us that we really are capable of some of the wonder and awe and amazement that we so seldom feel when we contemplate the eternal God and the cosmic glory of Christ and a real living contact between them and us in Jesus of Nazareth. When Jesus said, for this purpose, I have come into the world, he said something as crazy and weird and strange and eerie as any statement in any science fiction that you have ever read. Oh, how I pray for a breaking forth of the Spirit of God upon me and upon you, for the Holy Spirit to break into my experience in a frightening way, to wake me up to the unimaginable reality of God. One of these days, lightning is going to fill the sky from the rising of the sun to its setting, and there is going to appear in the clouds the Son of Man with his mighty angels in flaming fire, and we will see him clearly, and whether from terror or sheer excitement, we will tremble, and we will wonder how we ever lived so long with such a domesticated, harmless Christ. These things are written, the whole Bible is written, that we might believe, that we might be stunned and awaken to the wonder that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who came into the world. He says some things. He says how dead we are. How callous and unfeeling to your glory and your story. Oh God, how often I have had to repent and say, God, I am sorry that the stories men have made up stir my emotions, my awe and wonder and admiration and joy more than your own true story. Oh, how I pray for a breaking forth of the Spirit of God upon me and upon you for the Holy Spirit to break into our experience in a frightening way to wake me up from the unimaginable reality of God. This morning, I've entitled this message, Shock and Awe. That this morning, we would somehow understand who God is and really desire to know who He is. On March 21st, 
2003. We all watched in amazement as the historic city of Babylon was set aflame. The U.S. government called it shock and awe. Oh, that our hearts would stand in amazement of him as it does when we see the things around us. Oh, that we would be moved to change, not by the threat of destruction, discipline, or death, but by the amazement of God's glory, that we would stay mesmerized by his sheer splendor, by his majesty, by his power. Oh, what the Old Testament law could not do is change my heart. For what the law was powers to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Have I been changed? Have I been transformed? Or have I somehow just stuffed the wrong impulses down? The sure sign of change is this, that I've been transformed, that I've been made new. Repentance isn't weeping and wailing, it's change. Salvation, though it may incorporate weeping and wailing, is a transformed heart. It's change. Hebrews 10, 6 says, this is the covenant I will make with them. After that time, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their heart and I will write them on their minds. That we would no longer just have to follow these written rules, but he would write them on our hearts and that we would be in, inclined to him because he had done something within us. Piper says, it, am I more moved by the stories of man have you been more moved by a movie that man made? A powerful emotion? Or is it, is it that awe of God that transforms us? I want to be more transformed. I want to be more in awe of God than I am of man and what he can do. This is the year for transforming that God would frighten me, if necessary, to get my attention. See, many of us this year will have a good start, but again, we will end in mediocrity. We have good intentions. We start the year off right, but I cannot be okay. You cannot be okay with mediocrity. I must have more of him. I must say, as Paul did, I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to live in this place of wonder. I want to live in this place where I bask in his majesty. I want to stand frightened by his holiness. I'm going to take a short rabbit trail this morning. Death sometimes scares us. It intimidates us. But we are all headed there. Everyone in this room, we're headed to that destination. But God said through his son, I will change that result for all of you. That is the wonder. That is the miracle. Is that, you know what? We were destined to death through Adam's sin. We are all going there physically and spiritually unless Jesus came and he saved us. The incarnate Christ. That's the miracle. That's what should change us. That's the awe of God this morning. He gave me life. It doesn't end here. As bad and as good as this can be at times. It doesn't end here. Maybe you found your way back to a soulish life this morning. Things bother you. People bother you. The past bothers you. I have found my way back to this soulish area in my mind, will, and emotions, but I want to stand in the wonder of God. Some will say this morning, Greg, I don't know what you're talking about. This morning, I want to reignite, rekindle, restore, renew, rejuvenate that which remains in you. Over and over, you find it in the book of Revelation. To strengthen that which remains. To strengthen that which is there. Don't give up on what's there. He says, I know I planted this in you. Don't let that fall apart. See, this morning, pride cannibalizes our awe. 
when our thoughts drift to how poorly we've been ta we've been treated when we think we deserve more when we think that we're not good enough when our worship is devoured it's eaten up by self we remain under the umbrella here of our own authority and we can't recognize the greater authority see pride cannibalizes the awe of God it keeps us separated from him I want to enjoy his greatness. I want you to enjoy his greatness. Pride will devour that. There is an antidote to pride. Instead, not just not thinking about ourselves, but we become to this place where we just stand in awe of him constantly, remaining in awe of God. See, when we realize that it is our pride that pinned him to the cross, I can no longer stay there. God wants us to know this antidote to pride. This antidote to pride is remaining in awe of God. Self-authority kills your relationship with God. It kills your relationship with the church. It kills community. And ultimately, it kills the awe of God. It puts us back in charge. But Psalms 33, 8 says in the King James Version, Let the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of Him. Shock and awe is what we need this morning, what we need this year to shock my conscience back to the place where I stand in awe of God. Awe is defined as a reverential state of mind as a result of respectful fear and genuine wonder. When you go to the Grand Canyon, though it's just a hole in the ground, there is something awe-inspiring about it. You can see it in pictures, but when you stand next to the immensity of it, it changes your dynamic. When we stand next to the immensity of who God is, See, I don't believe we truly know who he is. If he, we did, we would be in awe. We would be transformed. It would change us. In 1 Kings chapter 18, there is a story about the awe of God before the people. Elijah stands on Mount Carmel. The prophets of Baal have been challenged to a showdown of epic proportions. Elijah calls down fire from heaven. It's powerful. The people's hearts melt and they turn back for that moment to God, that God would answer. And it says there in, in 1 Kings 18, Then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the soil, and licked up the water in the trench. When all the people saw this, they fell prostrate and cried, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. See, there's got to be that place in our lives where we stand in that place before God and we go, you are God. I don't, it's, it's an involuntary action when we stand in his presence. Our story today is I'm going to work backwards. What led up to this encounter? The awe of God. The setting is this. The king of Israel is Ahab. He's complacent in his marriage. He doesn't, he exerts his power and authority against God. Jezebel, his wife, secretly pulls the strings of the kingdom and the people are stuck in the middle. They're easily swayed, bamboozled, if you want to use that word, because the current monarchs. And then Elijah enters the fray. He tells the people, it's time for you to decide who is God. Is it Baal or is it the God of heaven, the God that we, we truly worship? See, this Ahab and Jezebel are an example of self-authority at its worst. Interesting enough, Baal, though linked back to the golden calf, Baal worship wasn't meant to take over. It was meant to be mixed. See, that's the way the enemy wants to work. He doesn't want to come in and say, okay, you just all out worship here. He says, no, what I want you to do is worship this along with God. Baal worship. Baal was known as the Lord of rain and dew. There were two forms of moisture that, that put off the, the, on the land there for that fertile, for that fertile crescent. It was this, he was also known as the storm god. And God had stopped the rain and the dew 
for the past three years. And here is the setting of the story. It says in 1 Kings 17, 1, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbite in the Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord lives, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Isn't it interesting that Baal who's known as the God of the storm, the God of the dew, the God of the rain. And God says, let me show you who really I am. I missed this part of the story because I focused so many times in so many years on the fire coming down from heaven and it excited me and I would get focused on that part and I missed the part that there was no water. Something had missed it in this story. I had missed this all along. I, I, in fact, in, if you go into 1 Kings 18.5, it says there, um, excuse me, I don't have it, but I'm going to read it to you. It says, and Ahab said, go throughout the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of our animals. It was so dire. It was so dry. That they went looking. Obadiah and, and Ahab separated and they went out looking for water. And it's in this setting that Elijah comes on the scene. In contrast to this drought, God says here in 1 Kings 33, Then he said to them, Fill four j large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. <coughs> for some reason... I love the idea that he was pouring water on this sacrifice, but I never, ex I never thought about the fact that there was a drought. There was no water around. Elijah finds water and says, what we're going to do is we're not going to use it for the animals. We're going to pour it out on the sacrifice. And not only once, but he says, do it again. And then he said, do it a third time. He ordered them the third time, and then the water ran down the altar and even filled the trench around the altar. It's in this setting. I don't know if you guys, maybe you guys are smarter than me, and immediately you got this, but I was like, wait a second. He's telling him them to pour out what they don't have. He's saying, I want you to pour out what you lack, what you don't have today. He says, I want you to pour it out on the altar. What you're lacking in this season, pour out on the sacrifice today. Your sacrifice today is Hebrews 13, 15. He says, therefore, continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of the lips <coughs> that openly profess his name. The first thing the enemy wants to do in your spiritual drought is take your praise. In difficulty, he wants to take what you already lack. The enemy wants you to focus on what you do not have so that you will not, grant, you will not be in awe of God on what he's given you. In the midst of this, he says, to the untrained eye, it looks like a waste. What a waste. Waste your worship. Pour it out on him. Think about it. Jesus, here he is in John chapter 12, verse 3. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. See, here, the, the, I'm sure they were already saying it. In fact, Judas says, couldn't that money have been used in a better way? We could have sold this and we could have fed the hungry. No, something about Jesus. I want you to pour out what you don't have, what you lack today. Some of you say, well, I don't have worship in my heart. God said, listen, what you need to do, what you don't have today, I want you to give. Some of you say, I don't have any money. He says, listen, what I want you to do is give out of what you don't have. Today you're bothered. You're saying, I don't, I don't have... I don't have patience. God said, listen, I want you to give patience in this situation. Some of you in your relationships, that person that comes along that just aggravates you. God said, listen, I want you to give what you don't have this morning. What a waste. Not with God. He takes what you lack and what you were without so that he can supply. Your, your problem this morning maybe is financial. He says so generously. He's saying this morning maybe you have problems loving. He says love generously. Maybe you have lack patience in a situation that's going on. He says give grace generously. Pour out in that area that you lack. 
Pour it into that area that's difficult, maybe that difficult person. Maybe it's a difficult family member. He said, listen, I want you to pour into them. Pour out to them. This morning, the principle is all throughout Scripture. In Isaiah 54, and I'm going to use the Amplified this morning, it says, shout for joy, O barren one. This is a woman who doesn't have any kids. She who has not given birth, break forth into joyful shouting and rejoice. She who has not gone into labor with child, for the spiritual sons of the desolate one will be more numerous than the sons of the married woman, says the Lord. Enlarge the sight of your tent to make room for more children. Stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare them. Lengthen your tent ropes and make your peg stakes firm in the ground for you will spread out to the right and to the left and your descendants will take possession of nations and will inhabit deserted cities. This morning he's saying, listen, what you don't have, maybe you don't have praise in your mouth this morning. Shout, joyful shouting, rejoice, praise, pour it out. In your lack, don't take it back. That was my own. He says, it shall be given unto you. Good men. You shake it together, running over. See, so many times we've heard these messages. Oh, it's all about the tithe. No, it's all about every situation in your life. That area that you are in drought of, that you lack, God says, pour that area back to me. The second thing Elijah does is take what he has an abundance of. Now, what do you have an abundance of in drought? I would. There is dry wood. What do you have an abundance of? And he says he arranged the wood pieces and laid it on the wood. This morning, what do you have an abundance of? Pride, self lack of patience. He's saying, I want you to place those things that you have an abundance of, that you don't need, <laughs> that you don't need for the king. And he says, I want you to place them on the altar. What you have an abundance of during drought, when you have an abundance of during your difficult, he says, place that on the altar. Pour out what you don't have and what you have an excess of, put it on the altar. This isn't a one-time occurrence. We're making sacrifice to God continually. Put it on the altar and burn it. I've said this about sanctification. It is that excavating and filling with God vacation process, removing and burning and refilling it with God's goodness of. If you haven't made strides in the kingdom today, I want you to know that the enemy loves to get your mind off the awe of God. Put a rock in your shoe to make it difficult to walk. He wants to introduce, and some of you know what I'm talking about, an irritant. Somebody or something that will just get under your skin. Maybe it's family. Maybe it's your job. He says, listen, all these areas, what you lack, pour out. What you have in excess of, burn it up. And then he says this, and Elijah, words we're going backwards. Then Elijah said to the people, come here to me. And they came to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. We rebuild the altars, the places of remembrance, the places that we commemorate that encounter with God and us. It's that place where we go, this is where I had that experience with God. And not that we go and worship it, but we go back to it because we want to be in that awe of God. We want to be awe, in that awe of his presence. It's got to be that place of encounter with God. We built an altar by starting out with the right foundation. And what's that foundation? It's devouring God's word, which keeps us in awe of God. The last thing this morning is in 1 Kings 17. It says, leave here, turn eastward. This is, this is before Elijah even makes his way to this place. And he says, hide in Kareth Ravine, east of the Jordan, you will drink from the brook, and I have directed ravens to supply you with food there. 
It's hiding in, his pl in this place with God. It's getting alone with God. It's breaking the ties with all the, the things that, that we think are important. It's, it's getting into that place where we move into a different direction. I want you to know here, he was going to go back across the Jordan. Remember, remember the children of Israel had come across the Jordan. That was a big step. He's being told, listen, I want you to go back there. And I want you to hide yourself. I want you to get alone with me. And I've directed ravens. Ravens are nasty birds. They're unclean. And he said, listen, I'm going to have them feed you. And I've already prepared water for you during this drought. See, that's the way God works in our lives. And, when, and in the midst of that situation, you go, well, when am I supposed to move forward? It's exactly like it is in, it for Elijah. It says, sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. When the brook dries up and God does not have something for you, then he's getting ready to move you to the next place. So this morning, what I want you to know is don't worry about it. Don't be fretting about it. Just keep your eye on the awe of God. Don't let all these other things. He says, listen, when that brook dries up, you're going to have to go look for new water or I am going to provide for you. One or the other, I will make a way. And you don't worry. You don't fret yourself up in all the irritants you just focus on God or what you don't have this morning focus on what you do have you have the king of kings and the lord of lords he he's in your heart say listen everybody in this world we're all going to go back to earth. but he says but those of you who know me I've got something prepared for you. I've got something that... So listen, don't worry about how it looks in this life at times. It may look dire. The brook may dry up. The ravens may be gone. That's okay. God says, listen, I will provide for you. I will take care of you. Cherith was the, this place where his national identity, his cultural identity, his individuality and identity, and even his religious identity would be challenged. Some of us, we've been challenged in that place. I know that's why I'm here today. I was in Assemblies of God, boy, all my life. But God said, listen, what I want you to do, I want you to follow me. I want you to get behind me. I want you to get in my stream. I want you to walk behind me. And you know what? When I got in and I started drafting behind God, everything changed. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about because you know you have this certain mindset of, okay, I've given my heart to the Lord, but we don't know what it looks like to really be in behind him and following him. We need a frightening encounter with God. I'm going to say this this morning. Our city needs a frightening encounter with God. Our churches, by city and nation, need a truly frightening encounter with God. It would be better to be drastically scared and to change our course than to continue on to destruction. It's like this. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. I know some of you guys are truck drivers in here. And you guys, have, we've driven before. And I remember driving and driving and driving and getting tired. And I was thinking to myself, I remember that time where I'm driving along. And all of a sudden, I just close my eyes for a second. And then all of a sudden, I'm drifting off to the road. And I'm, wah! You know, wake myself up. And I'm like, man, I start slapping myself. I need something drastic to keep me awake. I need, I need some Mountain Dew. I need some sunflower seeds or something to keep me moving. And sometimes that's... That's what we need spiritually. We need God's Mountain Dew <laughs> to wake us up. God, give me that frightening encounter. I want us all to be able to say that as we leave this place this morning. God, I need that frightening encounter with you. Change me. Don't let me just weep and wail. Let me change. Let me be transformed into your image. After the fire came down, Elijah announced that rain was coming. And in verse 41, it says that he tells Ahab, for there is a sound of heavy rain. I want you to know this morning that you were made for pouring. As Christians, as believers, we are made to be poured out. We are made to pour out his unconditional love to others, to pour out this good news that's been revealed to us. Sometimes fear will hold us back. 
It's like that living water that's flowing through us all of a sudden begins to freeze. But here's the situation. When you feel that beginning to freeze in you, you look to the awe of God. His radiance will then warm that back up and that water keeps flowing. Don't let it freeze in you this morning. Rain comes. The refreshing. The water represents the Holy Spirit. Get ready. Rain is coming. It may look dry right now, but God's saying, listen, you pour out. Pour out what you don't have. Burn up what you have in excess of. And let me then do this work in you, transforming you from the inside out. Let's